I'm Betsy Stapleton from the Scott River Watershed Council, as Brad said, up in the northern part of the state. And the Watershed Council has been working with PBR and uh, BDAs, two, two initials, process-based restoration and beaver dam analogs, since about 2014. And you'll hear more about our work from some of the others speaking today. Our intention today is to offer you a wide range of science-based topics uh, on the, on, around these issues. And we'll allow a couple questions after each topic and hopefully have time at the end to engage in a more um, uh, back and forth kind of discussion. If you have questions, please put them in the chat function. And we are going to be uh, uh, taking the chat notes. And if we don't get to answering your question during uh, today's meeting, we'll try and get back to you and follow up with as much detail as is helpful. So starting off today is a Stephanie Falzone from the um, Sustainable Conservation Organization, who has been a real leader in developing some of the streamlined permitting uh, mechanisms that many of you are now uh, deploying across the landscape. And Stephanie is going to let us know how this sort of restoration uh, fits into the state's major environmental initiatives. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for that introduction, Betsy. I'm a project manager at Sustainable Conservation and our organization advances the collaborative stewardship of California's land, air and water for the benefit of nature and people. And the program that I work on called Accelerating Restoration develops policy and regulatory incentives to help accelerate the pace and scale of habitat restoration implementation. We've been doing this since the 1990s, starting with the Partners in Restoration Program and have expanded our work from a regional to a statewide scale over time. In 2014, we sponsored the bill that created the Habitat Restoration and Enhancement Act, and we were involved in the legislation last year to reauthorize the program. Brad told us that our technical resources page is part of your orientation, which is great to hear. In addition to having those resources on our website, we provide free technical assistance to project proponents. We discuss permitting strategy with them and talk about how to take advantage of existing efficient permitting pathways, which is one of the reasons why it's important for us to stay up to date on restoration techniques and agency permitting efforts. You probably saw that the State Water Board adopted the statewide restoration general order on August 16th. We've been providing the State Board with technical assistance on that effort and are excited for project proponents to start using it. We really appreciate CDFW's involvement in that process and want to give a big thanks to Brad for his comments at the board meeting. We've also been working on a coordinated authorization with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA Restoration Center, and Army Corps that includes the same set of project types as the general order, which includes process-based restoration. You'll likely be getting a presentation from us in the future about these efforts, so I won't go into detail about them now. Before we get into the nitty gritty of process-based restoration and beaver dam analogs, the group thought it'd be a good idea to zoom out and put cutting green tape and these kinds of restoration projects in the context of Pathways to 30 by 30 and the Natural and Working Lands Climate Smart Strategy that the Natural Resources Agency released this spring to advance biodiversity and make our state more resilient to climate change. One of the pathways to 30 by 30 is to expand and accelerate environmental stewardship and restoration. And cutting green tape is part of this pathway. Accelerating on the ground projects and expediting permitting of restoration projects is one of the near-term priorities in the Natural and Working Lands Climate Smart Strategy. The strategy also recognizes that beavers contribute to climate action and that their dams support ecosystem health in many ways that other presenters will talk about. So the important work that you do with restoration proponents to get their projects permitted more efficiently is not only saving them time and money. Increasing the pace and scale of implementation is in service of these broader state priorities and goals that cutting green tape is a way to achieve. So we appreciate Brad inviting this group here today and thank you all for taking the time to be here so that you can learn more about process-based restoration, BDAs and beaver dams. And with that, I'll pass it on to our next presenter. We will move on now uh, to Karen Pope and um, have her presentation about what is the problem that PBR and BB BDAs are addressing. 
And Karen uh, is a preeminent meadow uh, restoration researcher and practitioner for the US uh, Forest Service Pacific Southwest Research Station. So Karen, I'm looking forward to hearing your talk. So um, I love this question that was assigned to me. Uh, and hopefully I can uh, convince you that we have quite a few problems to solve out there and that PBR is one of our best solutions. Um, and I, I really appreciate your willingness to, to listen to us and hopefully we're not just telling you something you already know. Um, so, I want to first start with a caveat that I work for the Forest Service and tend to work in mountain environments and forest landscapes. And um, that is not to say that PBR doesn't apply across all landscapes. Um, it's just where I tend to work and what I know is in the mountain landscapes. And so uh, that's what I'm gonna speak to here. And please feel free to extend uh, the, the tools and the thoughts to other, other landscape. So really quickly, um, I, I think it is important to set the stage and think about what we have out there. Um, I feel like every time I go into the mountains and look at drainages, I learn more about how we have really modified them. And um, you hear rumor, you hear thoughts uh, or discussions about 50% of meadows have been degraded. I have not seen a meadow that is not degraded. So um, I, I don't know where that other 50% is, but we have modified these landscapes through history. Um, and we can take it from, from wildfires that are, are mega fires now and that burn, um, burn everything and leave these exposed soils uh, to, to have crazy um, mudslides, et cetera, to um, climate change where we have rain happening instead of snow. Uh, we have put roads conveniently along water courses, uh, makes it a lot easier to build our roads. It also changes uh, flow paths. It, it blocks subsurface flows, brings them up to the surface, and then we constrict them through culverts. Uh, and, and what that does is really heighten the energy that's hitting the stream surfaces and meadow surfaces, floodplains in general. And what we end up with is uh, incised channels that are simplified and transport water out of the mountains. Um, and so when we put this all together, we've really increased our, the height of our peak flows and, uh, and sharpened the recession limb of the hydrograph. Um, and the ramifications of that are our summer base flows are drop. And so many of our perennial streams go ephemeral. And that can be really damaging to downstream users, whether they're human or fish or amphibians. And, uh, and so these are some of the reasons why uh, we really need to slow water, we need to regain groundwater connectivity. I'm gonna switch the slide because that's what I'm heading to. So yeah, how do we improve that summer base flow condition? Um, one major one is groundwater connection. And, and so taking advantage of low gradient areas and slowing the, the flows, spreading the water and let it soak into the ground. Uh, and then I think by looking at that big picture, we really see that we have to start working at landscape scales. Single site restorations can be really beneficial for that site and can help, but, but we've got to start thinking about um, catchments, watersheds, and even whole mountain ranges. And then uh, reducing cost and increasing speed of restoration across these watersheds to be able to work at those scales, we've got to start thinking about how do we, how do, we do this work effectively 
and as cheaply as possible. And then um, at the same time, it is important to think strategically. Uh, we fully understand that priorities tend to go where the money is, where people are interested in doing projects. Uh, but there, there is a way to start thinking about how do we incorporate stream and meadow restoration into existing management plans at landscape scales. Um, forest Service is doing all kinds of wildfire resi resistance, resilience planning, um, post-wildfire post uh, restoration, and, and incorporating these types of projects into those plans makes a, makes a lot of sense. And then, of course, partnering with Beaver um, is, is ultimately going to let us really scale up this work. So I, I do most of my work in meadow systems. And um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about that because meadows are somewhat of a low hanging fruit in that they already are tend to be very low gradient systems where water slows naturally. <laughs> And so uh, it's fairly easy to, to, to do a little bit of work to, to increase groundwater connectivity. Um, current conditions, uh, meadows, I'm say, gonna use the Sierra Nevada as an example, but um, pretty much statewide, uh, we've, we have a, a lot of meadows, over 20,000 meadows are mapped currently, uh, but they don't make up that much of the landscape. Um, there's a few large meadows, but mostly a bunch of small meadows. And, and if we think of the history of meadows, um, that, that number, that area is probably underrepresented because throughout the past two centuries, We've eliminated beaver. We've brought in tons of livestock for grazing. And then we've done all the road work and um, fire uh, prevention that has allowed conifers to encroach. Conifers, shrubs. And um, we think of this process over time and, and realize that Meadows are defined by vegetation and hydrology and soils, but vegetation is first and foremost when you're mapping them. And so have we lost these meadows? And so we, we did a, uh, so this is an example of a meadow that might have been lost. Uh, there's just a little remnant part. It clearly didn't do anything to stop fire. Um, but if you imagine some of these, these burned trees had been meadows, uh, possibly it could have. And so we did a, did a machine learning model, um, 60 hucktens across the Sierra Nevada, and using a very conservative out, output, <clears throat> we found that uh, it looks like meadows could occur or historically may have occurred in about three times the area that currently, where they currently occur. Uh, I'm going to whoop through this and, and just in case you don't believe me, this is the current meadow polygons. This is the LIDAR that shows the landscape under those polygons and then our model output. Uh, one more time, you can see the existing polygons. LIDAR that shows that floodplain zone and then our model output that pretty much covers that floodplain zone. Right now, it's all trees in those areas. And if I let the LIDAR come back again, you, you can quickly see there's incised channels all through that area where the forest is. So we believe these are areas that have converted to forest. Um, and that is a natural process, but we have um, sped it up and made it happen. And so uh, that brings us to this PBR discussion. And I think it's a natural place to go because A, you're using those trees uh, that, that are encroaching on the meadows. And 
B, um, it's it's quick. It's doesn't do any much harm to the landscape. In and in a way, it's sort of matches with a very low disturbance. Um, that can be really good for a, a meadow or a stream system. And I'm going to let other people talk about that, as I know they're experts. I do want to say that uh, we call it low tech <laughs> based restoration. I tend not to use the low tech term because I believe that we really need to think strategically, whether it's at a landscape scale or at a site level. And um, there are tools and the people that do PBR are really experts at finding those spots that make sense to do the work. It's not just anybody can do it and throw throw some wood into the channel. There, there is a lot of effort to find switch points to get the water out on the floodplain. There's a lot of effort thinking about how to deal with head cuts and um, and control structures and and such that that allow for the system to work as it's supposed to do without creating those resistant rock based um, control structures that don't give the system an opportunity to do what what it is supposed to do. And it, this is just an example of how we can apply it at, at a watershed scale. Um, the A figure is the existing meadows, the B figure is model output. And if we zoom in on some areas where, oh, and this is laid overlaid with uh, pod boundaries, which are fire boundaries for, for building in fire resistant landscapes. And so we just took existing um, landscape management plans and then overlaid them with our meadow output. And then if you zoom in, you can find these areas where the, the pod boundaries really align with um, stream and meadows. And so expanding those, uh, those boundaries by restoring these meadow systems could be really beneficial for creating fire resilient landscapes. So basically, I, I think we're, we really are interested in improving base flow conditions. Um, these problems are are at a landscape scale. So we have to start working at that scale. And then we also um, need to think strategically when we um, go to do the work. And yeah, and I'll pass it to the PBR experts from here. Well, thank you, Karen. And I think you definitely set the stage as to why we're doing this. Our next speaker is Emily Fairfax, who just flew in and made it in time. So I'm very appreciative. Otherwise I would have had, had to um, pretend to be Emily, which is a very, very high bar uh, to achieve. She's an assistant professor of environmental science and resource management at California State University Channel Islands, and also uh, holds an adjunct assistant professor position uh, at Utah State University. And she just is a pioneer of thinking about how beaver modified landscapes um, can affect uh, water storage and fire issues. So Emily, I am pleased to have you join us and, and be the next presenter. Awesome, thank you. Um, so apologies in advance if there's a few loud cars that drive by, I am outside of the coffee shop. Um, but so I'm gonna be talking to you about just very briefly Beavers in California, they're sort of the original ecosystem engineer and process-based restoration specialists. Um, so learning from them is definitely something that we should be considering and thinking about as we explore PBR in California's future. So Beavers 101, where are they um, in California specifically? And then what do they actually do and a little bit of what do they not do? So beavers have been in California for a very long time. There's a lot of evidence that has been compiled for us already that shows beavers um, from the very north part of the state all the way down south to where we border Mexico, up in the mountains, down to the coasts, through the Central Valley, along pretty much every single river and waterway and watershed, at least historically. And this is 
piece together from cultural evidence, from physical evidence, from trapper journals, from fur export logs. So it's like, this is not a question anymore. Beavers have been here a long time, um, probably on the order of millions of years, which is a lot longer uh, than people have been on this uh, area. And they are also here today still. So some people think, okay, well, yeah, we had beavers, but they're gone now and there's no room for them anymore. And that's just not true. This map on the left that I'm showing you is the iNaturalist observations of beavers in California. Um, iNaturalist is an app, if you're not familiar with it, where you can log sightings of beavers or other animals and see their distributions. And every little orange pixel on there is a sighting of a beaver. And the darker orange it is, the more overlapping sightings there are. And two quick things about this map. One, you can see the beavers are really everywhere. They're down there by San Diego, they're up there um, in Klamath, they're in the Sierras, they're down on the coast, they're in the Bay, they're in the Delta. Um, but there are some pockets, and I do want to emphasize that those pockets of observations are a function of both the number of beavers there, so there are a lot of beavers in the delta, um, but also the number of people there who are out observing them. And so you can get this, this is down by San Luis Obispo, quite a bright spot, um, but that's because there's some very active uh, beaver groups down there going out trying to catalog all of these animals. But either way, if you want to know if there's beavers by you or in an area you're working, a naturalist is a great place to look. Um, all you have to do is go out in the evening and you can snap a photo like this one that Virginia did up in Fairfield, California, of a beaver out doing its ecosystem services and modifying the landscape uh, all around us right now. So what do beavers do and a little bit of what do they not do? So they're here, um, that's established. What are they doing here physically? How are they changing the landscape? How do they turn a stream into this sort of complex wetland that I'm showing you in this photo? Most of our streams are unfortunately pretty degraded, especially in California. Um, they're simple, they're incised, they're disconnected from their floodplains, uh, but that doesn't stop beavers. So beavers will move into streams like this all across our state and they start building dams. And those dams slow the water down. They don't stop it. They are not complete water blocks. That's myth number one is that they completely stop water and they don't. These are inherently leaky structures that come in and out of states of repair. There's water going under, over, through, around. It is definitely not a uh, water block, but it is a flow obstruction. So it's slowing it down giving it time to seep out into the soil and reconnect to the floodplain. Busy as a beaver is a phrase for a real reason, and it's based on beaver ecology. They don't stop once they've built a nice little dam. They're ambitious. Uh, they continue to expand that dam, make it longer, larger, stronger, taller, um, making a bigger aquatic habitat for themselves. They do that because beavers are very awkward on land. So all of this engineering is motivated by the fact that if they're waddling around on the landscape, they can get picked off by just about any predator that wants them. Um, but in the water, similar to otters or other uh, large fatty marine mammals, um, they uh, are super slick once they're in the water. They can hold their breath for 15 minutes, they can outswim almost any predator. So they make these large ponds and then they also dig these canals out from their ponds to make sure that they have a safe home space and ways to navigate the landscape that are safe. So if they're out looking for food or building material, they can just jump into one of these canals that are filled with water and zip home to the main pond and go take refuge in their lodge. So I've been throwing around a little bit of beaver lingo already. Um, I want to put some images to those words. So in this picture, you can see the beaver's dam on the left and then the beaver's lodge on the right. Those are two separate structures. Beavers do not live in the dam, common misconception. Beavers swim around in their ponds, they go out in the landscape, they chew trees. All of the trees that they prefer to chew are trees that have co-evolved with them. And so when they chew, for example, a cottonwood or a willow or an aspen or birch, those trees very rapidly sprout back and regrow with vigor. Um, and there's been a lot of work showing that when beavers are regularly coppicing these trees, they actually do tend to be healthier forest stands overall in the riparian forest. So beavers are doing all of this incredible amount of work on the landscape. And it comes in a lot of different shapes and sizes. There's no prescri prescribed way that I can say, like, you're going to go out and see a dam and it's going to be three feet tall and 20 feet long. It just doesn't happen that way. Beavers have their own styles. They adapt to the landscapes that they're in. So this one, probably the tallest dam I've ever been at. Um, it's about 10 feet tall. This is what some people think of when they're like, oh, beavers are damming up everything. How is a fish going to get past it? Um, this is a really extreme example of a beaver dam. They are almost never like this. More often, there's something like this. This one's around three feet tall. Or this, this one's around, I don't know, eight to 10 inches tall. This one's kind of struggling. They're in Pismo Beach and they are building in an urban environment. So there's not a lot of great building material for them, but they're making do. Um, they can be quite long, even if they are short, and that's totally fine. It just broadens the wetland. And again, it does not act as a significant passage barrier for fish that live in these systems, including steelhead. 
Um, the water goes through the dam, it goes around the dam, there's lots of canals connecting it, and little baby fishes can actually get through dams, which is pretty impressive. A lot of people imagine them more solid than they actually are. There's also a lot of broken dams, so again, beaver dams are not always permanent in the landscape. Sometimes they'll be there for a very, very long time, like hundreds of years, but that tends to be in very high alpine systems where there's never like this super huge flow event that can wash it out, and it just sort of grows over with vegetation and becomes like an earthen berm. More often what we see down in the watershed is dams that are broken, dams that are repaired, the dams that are halfway repaired, um, and that's a natural part of their cycle and part of developing that dynamic riparian forest and wetland ecosystem. Sometimes you'll have lots of dams together, um, sometimes it's just a few. And I want to emphasize as well that these canals I mentioned earlier are equally important to the dam. They're definitely not as photogenic. If you try to take a picture of these on the ground, it just looks like you're taking a picture of the dirt. It's not a good photo. Um, but from drones, you can really start to see these little waterways snaking out into the rest of the landscape and across the floodplain, spreading that water out. And that is really key for developing this wetland ecosystem faster uh, and more reliably than, say, just waiting for the water to seep out from like a retention pond. This one as well, I want to emphasize in these canals, we've got a dam that's kind of arcing on the bottom half of that photo, and the canals connect the upstream side of the dam to the downstream side of the dam. And so beavers will swim across, they don't always have to waddle up and down their own dams, fish can swim, frogs can swim, amphibians can scuttle, or whatever movement you choose for them. Um, they're very, uh, there's a lot of connectivity in these landscapes. You think about a flow obstruction as maybe stopping connectivity, but in fact, the beaver dam and all of this landscape engineering tends to increase that hydrologic and ecologic connectivity. And that really changes how the water moves through the landscape too. And that is really important when we talk about beaver's role under climate change as we feel increasingly intense droughts and fires and natural disasters. When we don't have beavers, the streams have pretty limited impact on the subsurface water. So all of the water um, that is running through them doesn't have a lot of time to sink out into the soil. So they have this very narrow area of influence. When we have beavers, it's a different story. You've got that great big wide pond. You've got all these little canals that are kind of like drip irrigation lines running across your floodplain. Um, none of that actually matters too much for droughts and fires when we're in a rainy period, but guess what? We're almost never in a rainy period because it's California. Um, we're always in droughts. And whenever we're in a drought, the plants are really reliant on water that they can access underground. So stored soil water, groundwater, um, sort of that influence from our surface water features that was maybe banked during rainier periods. And when we have degraded streams, there's not much banked. But when we have the beaver pond, it's been storing water in the soil, in the pond, in the canals, every rainy period. And so you get this huge sponge that the plants can effectively continue to drink out of, even though there hasn't been rain in six months or maybe a year. And that matters when there's one careless match or one careless power line. Whatever the ignition event is, it really matters because fire burns whatever's driest and easiest to burn. It's a simple physics process. It's not a moral decision that the fire's making. It's just burning whatever's crunchiest. And unfortunately, that is a lot of the vegetation in the landscape when it's under drought stress. But in the beaver ponds, you don't really feel that drought stress on the vegetation because they've been irrigated from below um, with all the soil water for the whole dry season. And I've seen this personally in my research um, for at least three years, and then the drought ended in that study. So this is a long-term uh, durable buffering. It's not like they can be buffered for a week. It's much longer than that. We've actually seen this too. These photos um, from Dr. Joe Eaton are very famous now, and they're pretty stark. You can see the streams without beavers versus the streams with beavers during wildfire and the absolute dramatic difference in how they responded to that. Um, without beavers, you had the fire come scorching through the entire floodplain, burning right down to the river bottom and obliterating that riparian ecosystem. When we had the beavers, that is not the case. They are effectively protecting it from wildfire. They're buffering it against the flames because honestly, they're just too wet to burn. Everyone's on board when you're like, oh yeah, yeah, dry stuff burns so easy. And then you're like, all right, well, wet stuff doesn't burn as much. And people are like, wait, what? Really? And that's what the beavers are doing. They're just making a lot of wet stuff. And that's actually not all they're doing. So beavers do an enormous amount of work in our um, landscapes and in our riverscapes. And it's valued at about $179,000 per square mile per year. So this is an incredibly valuable source. Of, that is higher than my salary. Um, and so, you know, if you got all these beavers doing this work for you, think about all those dollars that you can be dedicating to other projects or using to support the expansion of beavers to continue to build up even more of this resilience. Um, there's a lot on this figure, but basically what it's showing you is that the 
value of beavers comes in the form of extreme event moderation, which I briefly touched on just now, but also things like water supply, greenhouse gas sequestration, the recreational hunting and fishing, lots of ducks and all sorts of uh, fish that people like to hunt and fish for are abundant in these systems, um, non-consumptive use, water purification, I mean the list goes on and on, beavers are doing so much. Um, and if you want to learn more about this, definitely ask me more questions after my ultra micro presentation. But in summary, I think a lot of people, myself included, would like to see more beaver benefits on the landscape. This is a very low cost, um, high return investment that we can make. And in order to get those benefits, we need to both support beavers and their habitat. So we have some beavers in California, definitely not as many as we should. Um, and we have a lot of habitat that's maybe not an ideal state. And so this, we need to take a two-pronged approach, support the beavers we have. Um, if they are in place with a conflict, maybe work on some conflict mitigation there, or at the last resort, maybe relocate them, but also work on their habitat. Let's make it so that they can thrive in a lot more of the state so that they can expand on their own. And to do that, building structures like beaver dam analogs, um, which I'm sure more people are going to talk about today, and doing PBR is incredibly important. So these are all steps to get these incredible benefits so that instead of us having to put in 80 hour weeks out on the landscape, we can give 40 hours to the beavers and just do 40 hours ourselves. So thank you. Um, I'm happy to answer your questions now, but also later on in this meeting. Well, Emily, I always just enjoy your pictures so much of, of what the variety of beaver effects on the landscape are because I don't think people um, have a such a large picture in mind. Do we have a question for Emily right now? Let's, I'm gonna check the chat really quickly. And uh, uh, it's very fun to look at the chat and all the enthusiasm and it looks like there may be a follow-up presentation in the works. Um, in meantime, our next speakers are Bob Pagliocco um, and Sherry Whitmore from NOAA, and they've been on the legal and permitting journey related to BDAs specifically uh, since, since the very first uh, BDAs went in, in in the Scott watershed in 2014. And so they're going to um, talk about uh, some of the thornier issues in regards to uh, beaver related restoration and BDAs uh, in regards to fish passage. Well, thanks, Betsy. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining today. Uh, Betsy asked Sherry and I if we would talk about some of the history of kind of um, the conversations we've had over the years as BDAs um, and beaver restoration and fish passage kind of came together at a crossroads. Um, I'm going to kind of talk about the history of kind of where we started off with the first one funded in California, and then Sherry's going to talk about a very specific and cool uh, experiment that um, that her and some of her team members did uh, to collect some data on fish passage and BDAs. Can you go to the next slide? So I was uh, lucky enough to be on the funding committee that recommended funding the first BDA in California in 2013. And the Scott River Watershed Council uh, came with a proposal to uh, put six BDA sites with six BDA structures at each site in the Scott River and several tributaries as well. Um, I was super stoked about this because I had been reading about these things in Oregon and Washington. And uh, I'm very uh, interested in the benefits of slow water uh, habitat because through uh, off-channel ponds, I saw that fish grow like gangbusters in slow water habitats. And those are the fish that are gonna be coming back to be the adults because um, they're gonna be the winners when they head out to the ocean at a larger size. Um, but I knew that this being a new um, you know, restoration technique in California, we were gonna need some data for a proof of concept. So this program was really flexible. We actually had an opportunity to go um, ask them if they were interested in taking additional money and setting up a monitoring program so that we can learn from it. Uh, and they were willing. So um, we, we put together a robust monitoring plan looking at water quality, um, both pre and post uh, groundwater recharge, habitat conditions. And we set up a pretty cool fish passage uh, study through pit tagging because I knew that that was definitely gonna be something that everyone was interested in as this, um, this project came into California. Um, but permitting this thing was, was 
pretty challenging. It's a brand new restoration technique. You've got a, you know, a hard structure going across the creek. Uh, it was pretty challenging. And CDFNW was a lead CEQA agency and through the 1600 permit process, racked their brains and looked at all the different tools in the toolbox and decided to use uh, the categorical exemption for scientific research for the CEQA path. They um, thought that that was the, the best tool in the toolbox at the time. Um, and then ended up, because it was experimental, reducing the scope of the project uh, to three sites um, with only two BDAs at each site. Now that worked for the permitting pathway, but um, for the, the structural elements of it, it, it inadvertently eliminated much of the redundancy, the stability uh, and the synergistic effects um, that we need for these BDA sites to, um, by constructing multiple structures at a single site. These things act pretty similarly to like willow baffles or large wood uh, jams. They have to kind of work in concert uh, with each other. So uh, another thing we came, uh, that, that we encountered during the permitting process um, was Fishing Game Code 5901, which is essentially uh, a really awesome fish and game code uh, that's on the books that helps prevent a lot of fish passage barriers. Um, and it says it's unlawful to construct or maintain um, any device that prevents, impedes, or tends to prevent or impede the passing of fish both up and downstream. Um, so this was a challenge for the first folks to ever see the first BDA come in through the regulatory programs in California. So one of the terms um, of the 1600 agreement was that the, um, the, the uh, dam had to be breached and inadvertently that uh, significantly reduced the habitat availability upstream. There was thousands of fish up in that um, pool, that pond above the beaver dam. And uh, unfortunately, it also kind of invalidated that pit tag study because we were no longer looking at whether fish can uh, pass over a BDA. Um, we now had a BDA that was breached. Um, so we quickly realized that we should all get the regulatory agencies together and have a conversation so that we can all come to an understanding of kind of what we're all trying to do here um, with this new restoration technique and kind of work out some of the kinks. So we started um, a group up called the BDA technical team. And it was made up of several uh, agencies, mostly uh, folks from Northern California, Sacramento and above uh, to the border, including some folks from ODFNW because they also had quite a bit of experience um, with BDAs and fish passage over these structures. Um, and we're kind of tasked with developing, you know, a common understanding of how to permit, fund, and monitor uh, both the, the projects that we already had going in California and then also the projects that were coming because we'd already seen quite a bit of grant applications for some new ones coming online at this point in time in 2016. Um, you know, there was a general agreement to collect more monitoring data uh, to inform these projects and build up the confidence that we would need um, to fund and permit these things in the future. And then it became obvious um, as these structures needed maintenance, especially the ones in the Scott that uh, were limited to only two structures per site, that an adaptive management um, and kind of a, a monitoring element would need it to be included in the permitting and in the funding as well. Um, and there was some general agreement on some of these projects that we could be consistent with Fish and Game Code 5901 you know, if we had some of the data showing that, you know, fish could pass in the wet season um, or if fish were not necessarily actively migrating in the low flow season. And Seth Ricker was part of that team. And one of the things he did uh, during the, the BDA technical team years is uh, he analyzed about eight years of data of pit tag antenna movement data on freshwater creek from juvenile coho and steelhead and found that the vast majority of the fish, they hunkered down in those summer months. Um, and he also looked down on uh, some of the data on the Russian River Tribs and, and found that to be true as well. So um, what we got out of that um, was to manage for the populations and not individuals. And what I'm uh, referring to is if you have, you know, a beaver dam 
uh, pond that's providing slow water habitat um, for you know a thousand fifteen hundred fish that um, habitat is uh, significantly more valuable to the population as a whole than potentially um, you know blocking uh, 10 or 15 fish that are trying to migrate out of a main stem you know during the shoulder season um, as you know the flows begin to recede and um, and fish are trying to redistribute so we also agreed that we need to continue to gather more data as well you can go to the next slide so um, these data points are, uh, are what we basically are using to build our confidence and to understand these structures, um, you know, as we move forward in, in funding and permitting. This is just a, a sampling of the library of, of uh, literature that has, has come out uh, both before, during, and since um, this, uh, this BDA experiment that we had in the Scott River. But um, there's a lot of literature out there talking about the benefits of uh, these things to groundwater recharge. And as Emily had just talked about, um, making things less crunchy <laughs> and uh, unburnable and, and getting these things um, you know, wetter, recharging the groundwater, improving temperatures, um, having these landscapes be more resilient to climate change, and then several other studies, including quite a few theses um, on uh, fish passage as well. So um, as these, these data points came online, um, gave us uh, a lot of confidence. And uh, NIMS in 2019, uh, we revised our 2001 guidance and to emphasize that our fish passage criteria, uh, it only uh, applies to essentially culverts and bridges um, for baffles inside stream crossings and uh, aprons, uh, both upstream and downstream of culverts or fish passage channels. A lot of times you see those down in Southern and South Central uh, California, and they do not necessarily apply to BDAs or large wood structures or other, um, other uh, nat more natural features there. So that's the way we, we, we view the difference between like a concrete dam versus a BDA. And because of that confidence, um, we now, in our Sacramento pro programmatic biological opinion, our Santa Rosa programmatic biological opinion, and our Arcata area biological opinion programmatic, um, allow us to permit these things programmatically as well. And we put language into the latest Arcata um, um, programmatic biological opinion, and then also the Sacramento one. So that CDFNW can very easily write a consistency determination on that. So that's another tool in your toolbox that you guys have um, as you're entering the cutting the green tape world and you um, encounter these um, projects in the future. And then uh, Stephanie and I have been working uh, and Brad to some extent and several others have been working on um, a US Fish and Wildlife Service uh, permit. And by the time of this presentation, I was hoping to say that it was signed, but it should be signed any day now. But that's going to be a statewide um, restoration programmatic as well. So through the years, we've um, we've built up that confidence and that's kind of how we approach um, uh, permitting um, and just viewing the, the BDAs and, and beaver dams and beaver restoration. And I'm gonna kick it to Sherry here, who's gonna talk about a really cool study that uh, her and some of her colleagues did in Sugar Creek. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Um, so during concurrently, while this BDA tech team was uh, meeting and discussing the challenges, um, there was definitely a call for more science, more data points, more understanding about how fish um, pass and get around BDAs and when they pass. So um, if you want to scroll to the next slide, um, we, uh, Michael Pollack from the Northwest Fisheries Science Center with NOAA and myself and then Eric Yokel with the Watershed Council in the Scott River um, developed this fish passage experiment at the Sugar Creek site, which had been really the site of the, the, you know, the highest contention and discussion about fish passage. So um, we really wanted to um, investigate more about how fish pass there and then have this publication that just came out in May um, that describes, you know, greater management implications and, you know, NOAA's approach to, um, uh, to managing passage around, around BDAs and beaver dams. So Bob got to this um, for the most part. Um, 
you know, CDF&W's code um, appeared to be in conflict with a lot of NOAA Fisheries um, Endangered Species Act um, um, mission as far as preserving critical habitat. And so opening up those dams could um, destroy critical habitat. And so um, we continued to have this discussion and this conflict about how best to manage these sites. And we wanted to just know more about how and when um, fish pass beaver dams and you know, how best to um, manage them, the, these agencies who is trying to, to do the same thing as far as um, protect and preserve fish habitat, how we can work together and both, um, and both you know, successfully enforce our, enforce our regulations. So there's a good discussion. And in fact, I'd say that's the most important part of this paper, which I'll spend more time talking about that than the actual experiment about, you know, kind of the implications of this fish passage experiment. So let's keep moving, next slide. So the experimental conditions, we wanted to look at the Sugar Creek site that had been the, the site with most of the discussion about fish passage and um, create an experiment at low flow conditions during the summer when um, it appeared that fish couldn't pass and uh, CDFNW had the code um, to, to create fish passage there and, and potentially that code um, requiring uh, um, the Watershed Council to open up those dams to create fish passage. So we um, worked during that, that low flow season and identified multiple flow paths that went over and around and through the BDAs. And we tagged and moved coho and steelhead downstream of the BDAs. And what we wanted to do is really identify each of the flow pathways and uh, characterize the jump height, the velocity, and the gradient of those flow paths and see how fish would move over them. And then we contextualized this experiment by um, describing the habitat that was upstream of the, of the BDAs and doing a population estimate and then um, describing how the fish are responding to that habitat with their growth and survival estimates. So this picture is in the publication. It's uh, This is the experimental setup. You can see that there's those two BDAs um, there, BDA1 and BDA2 there in Sugar Creek. And uh, the release pool downstream um, is a nice deep pool. And we had a block net at the downstream end to ensure that no fish went downstream. We conducted the experiment in October, so temperatures weren't adding any stress to these fish as we tagged and moved them around. And, um, and then each of these flow paths that are identified with the letter A there um, had the pit tag antenna on them. So we can tell when and how the, these fish are moving and which flow path they, they chose to, um, to move through uh, with passing the BDAs. So there was actually three experiments that we that we cited that we described in the in the um, publication, but I I don't really want to go through all the numbers and details, but you could read more about them if you want to know more there. But the key findings that I think are most important here are that um, in the primary experiment where we moved 155 coho downstream of the BDAs, 91% of those moved upstream of the BDAs within 36 hours of release. So they had no problem and they quickly found their way back to their preferred habitat. At the end of the experiment, um, which I think was about two weeks, um, there were no fish that remained in the release pool. They all managed to get upstream. And 47% of those coho used at least one of the jump pathways that were between 15 and 16 inches high, which is significantly higher than, um, than the original um, fish and game uh, code that was requiring, I believe, six inches or less um, jump height for passage. And then the side channel gradient was pretty steep. It was 8 to 11 percent. And this graphic just shows, um, if you could just, yeah, this graphic just shows um, really how quickly these fish moved. And so if you wanted to study that in detail later, you could. But um, we, we were able to detect all the fish in the release pool and then all of them moving upstream. Um, into the um, into the original BDA ponds, and you can see with the different uh, bars there how they moved and when they moved. And there was that big jump uh, or that big uh, group that moved up after that that second night. So um, to contextualize this and to provide you know a, a richer discussion, we described the habitat characteristics and identified that there were there was over 7,000 square meters of slow water habitat upstream of these BDAs that was valuable to fish. And we um, estimated that that habitat could sufficiently support 
over 6,700 coho par. And through a mark recapture population estimate, we estimated that there were just over 2,500 coho par, which indicates that habitat is being underutilized and there's, there's room for more basically um, fish to grow there. And um, the summer and winter survival was just astounding. We were tagging fish in the summer as soon as they are big enough to tag in about June or July. And then they were essentially recaptured about a year later when they outmigrated and they passed the pit tag antenna that was at the mouth of um, Sugar Creek. And we found that we were able to recapture 88%. And you know the survival may actually be higher, but um, that was, just keep it there for a second, Betsy. Move it back, please. Thanks. Um, that is actually the highest uh, rate of survival that we've been able to find in the literature. And these two pictures do a good job of just showing like how, why this habitat is so valuable and, and what a, a dramatic change um, that we saw at Sugar Creek. And so that top picture there is the, is the site in Sugar Creek where the BDAs were constructed. And the lower part of Sugar Creek there would go dry each year or most years. And then uh, the lower picture, Betsy probably knows, but was just, I think a year or two after those BDAs were constructed the same place, the same time of year. And you can just see how much water there is and how much space there is for fish to rear. And then obviously we've shown that it is very valuable habitat with the, the survival rate that we've been seeing of fish and the growth rates too are, are really high compared to other places that we've studied in the Klamath. All right, next slide. So um, the, the main discussion in our paper at the end um, was talking not just about the fish passage, but just really how um, the habitat trade-off, the habitat trade-offs that you need to consider when thinking about fish passage and connectivity at these BDAs. And so um, we spent a lot of time um, talking about the, these, key po these key points here. Um, so we think it's important to consider the timing of fish movement. Um, we cited numerous studies that indicate that fish only are moving during these seasonal high flow events that, that Bob also discussed in the, in, the, in the spring and in the fall. And so really fish movement is only, or fish passage should only really be prioritized during those times when fish are actually using um, those migratory corridors. And then consider the population level impacts. Again, um, like Bob was saying, manage for the population level, not the, the individual level and um, consider, consider the detriment to the population if those dams may be breached. And then prioritize the habitat quality over habitat connectivity. We speculated that the, the, in the case of coho salmon that really require the slow water to rear for an entire year in fresh water, that decades of emphasizing habitat connectivity reduced that slow water habitat and has actually contributed to their widespread decline. And then consider the importance of the in-stream obstructions. You know, we started decades ago by removing wood jams um, that we perceived as blockages to migratory corridors and beaver dams are, are the next thing that, you know, that people perceive as obstructions. But in, in essence, they are actually really important to create this complex and dynamic habitat um, that we're seeing that creates such high survival and growth rates of these fish. And so we recommend that the, the managing agencies really take a more nuanced approach to fluvial ecosystem management and recognize that dynamic ten tension between the need for habitat connectivity and habitat quality and um, the balance between fast and, and slow water habitat. Well, thank you, Sherry and Bob. Um, you certainly went through the permitting journey and, and spent a lot of time thinking and, and communicating about these issues. Both Bob and Sherry talked about the disadvantage of breaching beaver dams, and our next speakers are um, Kate Lundquist and uh, Brock Dolman from the Occidental Arts and Ecology Institute, and they were um, involved in a very sad instance where a natural beaver dam was breached, but it did give the opportunity to really understand uh, what the population level effects of doing so might be. So um, Brock, I believe you were the nominated speaker. So if you would share that um, case study with us. Great, thanks, Betsy. Hi everyone, happy to be here with you all. And um, thanks Brad for setting us up and everybody from TFW for being here. Yeah, so uh, I'm on behalf of Kate Lundquist and myself, who work for the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center and our Water Institute and specifically the Bring Back the Beaver campaign. 
we just wanted to share a cautionary tale, if you will, about um, uh, there's a lot of talk of an impact with respect to depredation or, or trapping of beaver and the actual killing of the, the mammal itself, but often there's not enough uh, consideration with respect to the modification of beaver dams, whether that's a full removal of the dam or some folks who breach the dam to drain water for whatever reason. And so we just wanted to offer up this um, situation. But I did want to start off with the fact that um, we just wanted to say yay <laughs> to all of you all. This is our little beaver cheerleader posse here about the, the passage via the Governor Newsom's uh, proposal, the legislature signing to support you all at the department in a first ever brand new beaver restoration program and the development of a beaver management plan. And we've been, Kate and I and others have been appreciating and valuing the collaboration to date with, with Chad Dibble and Scott Gardner and others who I know are some are on this call today. And just appreciate this quote by Governor Newsom about the idea that um, to be successful in our efforts to protect biodiversity, the department must take a proactive leap towards bringing back beavers to onto the landscape through a concerted effort to combine prioritized restoration projects, partnerships with local, federal, and state agencies and tribes, and updated policies and practices that support beaver management and conservation throughout the state. So we are so happy to collaborate with you all on that vision for sure. Um, and let's see. So the incident we just wanted to mention, in fact, uh, and Kate and I were not specifically involved with this, although we were alerted very quickly by the landowner who was. This is so we're up in the area of the on the Trinity River system, kind of between Weaverville, south of Douglas City, uh, that area um, on Browns Creek. You can see in this image here from the landowner, there was a significant beaver pond in the summer on the system. The stream temperatures were very low. The flow in and the flow out were more or less equilibrated in this situation. And, and then basically, um, apparently there were some complaints downstream by other users that had more to do with uh, flow and water rights. And so a, a CDFW warden uh, went up to investigate and apparently found the beaver dam there and perceived that dam, we're not exactly sure what the ultimate perception was, but against the wishes of the landowner commenced to um, breach that dam and tear that dam down under the guise of basically saying that, well, he's not a biologist, he's just following the code. And so a, as soon as that dam was breached, apparently within, within a day and then the ensuing week, the entire system was drained and the temperatures went up and significant amount of habitat was lost for a number of species. And this image we, Kate and I received very early on from the landowner of this landowner and his wife who systematically went around and picked up the, um, all of the dead organisms. And if you look closely in there, you'll see a number of salmonids, steelhead, there were definitely coho uh, take here. There were amnesties from lamprey. There was one Pacific uh, giant salamander, there were numbers of invertebrates, and who knows how many countless zooplankton and other things. Plus there was uh, um, people's wells in the adjacent area, including the landowner. All of a sudden their shallow gallery wells also showed a significant decline in, in, the, in the actual static elevation. And so that's a, a really, I think this is just a, a, a significant case study to visually represent and document the power and profound benefit, especially in these uh, summer impoundments where they're holding critical habitat for these species and otherwise low flow uh, seasonal moments. And so that certainly got the, um, <laughs> the attention and ire of a number of folks and the Board of Supervisors in Trinity County um, was less than happy with it. I did choose, I think, strategically here in the letter from Center for Biological Diversity to redact the names of the landowner and the warden. I'm not, we're not interested here in throwing anybody under the beaver bus on this one, but more as a case study about just thinking about permitting and the benefits of natural beaver dams, or as we just saw from the studies of BDAs as well, and these, um, these habitat features, are, which are not functionally, in, for the most part, as Emily also spoke to, are not passage barriers, but actually fish habitat creators and critical habitat creators. And there are times, and we could go into this at length, but we don't have the um, 
time here. So much to say, but there's a number of non-lethal coexistence management strategies that are available, that are affordable, that are accessible, that people are trained up to do for how we can live with uh, beaver dams, natural beaver dams, if we needed to manage the amount of water, the uh, extent of inundation or not. There's pond levelers, there's different types of culvert inlet protection, there's the new beaver back saver. We're working with duck clubs and rice growers and National Wildlife Refuges in Sacramento on the two track weirs to manage. So we have all the tools in the toolbox to coexist with beavers, live with beavers, manage flow, work with them, honor water rights, water quantity, quality, habitat, recharge, fire protection, carbon sequestration, biodiversity, and just the aesthetics of getting to live with beavers. And so with that, um, check out our booklet here. And uh, Kate is online. To, with us and and so if there are questions for either of us now or at the end by all means we'll take them then and i'll leave it there hope you don't well brock your um cute beaver fan club picture got a too cute comment in the uh -huh. chat so um, congrats there and um I have a feeling we've been preaching to the choir from reading through the chat and the enthusiasm i see there for these uh, techniques. And now um, maybe what you've all been waiting for is some actual practical and theoretical aspects of BDA restoration. We're privileged to have Nick Bowes from um, an academic setting, the Department of Watershed Sciences of USU, but now out in the field, uh, actually on the practical side of things. So Nick, I'm, I'm looking forward to learning from you. All right. Uh, yeah, I was asked to give a, a talk about, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, I was asked to give a talk about a couple of issues. Um, and so I, I'm going to talk about um, the concerns related to uh, kind of temporal considerations of process-based restoration and also concerns about uh, the the, well, I guess I was asked to talk about kind of the counterintuitive um, idea that sediment is our friend. And I want to try to make that so it's not counterintuitive, um, but rather a really important geomorphic process uh, that is necessary with process-based restoration. So uh, I'm owner of Ecological Research. Um, we've done a lot of studies to evaluate the benefits of stream restoration. This is actually a picture of Bridge Creek where we, I worked with uh, Chris Jordan, Michael Pollack to develop um, actual, this is where we came up with the term BDA. Uh, I also work on another experiment to look at where we develop post-assisted log structures. And it's been a wild ride ever since then. Um, we've taught several dozens of uh, PBR courses. Um, so I, I do that uh, as an adjunct faculty at Utah State University. And then we started our um, own consulting firm to actually implement um, stream restoration. We've put in thousands of structures over probably 100 different projects throughout the West. And so i um, just share with you some of my um, thoughts on this. Um, so I think some of these concerns maybe come from um, maybe not having a, a full picture of how process-based restoration uh, works. And so I, I wanted to just kind of give an overview to describe some of the geomorphic processes that we're trying to harness um, when we do this process-based restoration approach. Um, one of the main impairments that we're often trying to uh, address with process-based restoration is uh, channel incision. And that can, happen for a variety of reasons. Um, one of the main reasons we think is that a lot of systems are structurally starved because of the continual removal of wood for centuries and the near extirpation of beavers. Um, channel incision can happen rapidly. And these things, these incised channels can recover naturally, but it has to go through this widening process first to decrease the unit stream power, build up inset floodplains, um, decrease gradient, and that can start to lead to sediment um, 
positing on the stream bottom and a grading, and you get this a grading and widening um, that happens uh, to uh, that eventually allows the stream to reconnect to what we think is a more um, appropriate reference condition. This anastomosing reference um, condition that Kluwer and Thorne refer to as stage zero. So there's a couple things I want you to kind of take away from this stream evolution model. Um, one is this, the time frames here. Um, these represent years. And so this can take uh, a year or 10 years for this incision to happen quite rapidly. And so a lot of these systems are quite fragile. And then this widening could take a decade or decades and the uh, grading um, several decades, and it could take a millennia for these things to uh, naturally recover. And so that's a long time frame. Uh, we wrote a paper uh, associated with Bridge Creek um, to say that beavers can really short circuit this cycle by building their dams, having the dams end cut, widening the channel, collecting sediment behind it, aggrading the channel, and this back and forth between dam blowouts and um, uh, widening and grading can quickly lead to a reconnected floodplain. And we can, we can mimic that with uh, beaver dam analogs and log structures. And so this can really short circuit that uh, natural recovery rate, but it's still, we're talking decade to decades. And, you know, in this case, um, we're trying to, oops, uh, this is the bioscience paper. We're trying to use stream power to upgrade the system um, and eventually reconnect the floodplains. Uh, but, you know, this is Bridge Creek. This happened fairly quickly, a couple of years um, to get kind of that first stage, but it can take a decade or more for that to happen. And that kind of doesn't jive necessarily with the way funding cycles work or permitting cycles work. And if we want to harness the power of the stream to do this work, we're gonna to have to start thinking about how that funding cycle um, and that permitting cycle differs from your traditional stream restoration approach, which is highly engineered, kind of a one and done approach. And, um, you know, trying to fix a form that doesn't change much through time. Um, and so those are going to be challenges uh, we're going to have to um, deal with with process-based restoration. The other uh, take home I want to um, talk about is this, when we get widening here, what has to happen? We have to get erosion. We have to have erosion that um, allows this, these banks to move. And we have to get a deposition um, for aggradation. So we, we have to deal with, um, well, we're trying to promote these dynamic um, situations with or erosion and deposition. And uh, there's a concern that, you know, erosion is bad, right? And for those, okay, sorry, I missed uh, <laughs> something here. Uh, I, just going back to the time scale, uh, I, I, I got, let me let me just back up here. Okay, the time scale. Uh, it's it's important to if we want to improve our restoration that we deal with these kind of multiple steps um, if we want to ensure the success of these process based restoration. So again, this goes back to the time thing. Um, what we recommend is that people put in pilot structures. Uh, you're going to learn a lot by putting in a few structures and learn from your mistakes. This is the first PALS we ever built um, in the Asotan. Uh, what we realized is that these posts weren't high enough or they weren't crossing. A lot of this wood floated away when the, the stream came up. These structures didn't go far enough across the stream, so they weren't eliciting the geomorphic responses that we're hoping. So you can learn a lot from um, pilots. Maintenance is really important. You're going to lose some wood. You're going to you're going to have beaver damp. Your BDAs, some of them breach. You're going to have to maintain those. And so, um, again, this is a multi-step process, not a one and done walk away. And then there's phases. Um, 
you know, when your BDAs fill up with sediment, you have to go to the next stage and start building BDAs on top of your BDAs. And so, um, you know, this is Bridge Creek after it filled up um, after a couple of years. And if we want to continue that process moving forward, we need to build another round of restoration. And places that are highly in size, you know, that's, you can't build up too fast. You have to build up in stages. And so the idea of phases is important. Okay, back to my widening component, um, bank erosion. So, you know, this, this is a concern is that we're gonna promote bank erosion by end cutting of these dams or we're actually in a lot of cases we, with these post assisted lock structures are trying to erode banks to uh, widen the stream or reconnect the floodplain. And so there's concern that this brings in fine sediment and what's wrong with fine sediment? Fine sediment can suffocate eggs um, yeah, that's a, that it is a concern that eggs can be suffocated, but I, I think it's also important to put this in context of the whole life cycle. Um, you know, what is important for these, for these fish? Is it just spawning habitat or do we need pools and ripples? And, you know, a lot of banks can contain all this material. It's not just fine sediments, it's gravels, it's cobbles. This is the material you need for aggregating this material you need to build floodplains there's you can actually start harvesting different materials with structures from different banks for different purposes and so when we get bank erosion um, we actually see some pretty big benefits to that um, this is a paper that where um, some riprap was removed so that the the stream could do its do its thing um, Red is erosion, blue is deposition. Once that riprap was removed, these colors represent different geomorphic units. This was pretty much homogeneous. And now we get this huge increase in the diversity of geomorphic units by allowing the, the stream to be dynamic and eroding these banks. So we got to put all this stuff into context. The idea with process-based restoration um, with structures is to put structures in and create hydraulic diversity is hot, the, the hydraulic diversity amplifies geomorphic processes, allows for different deposition and erosion patterns and creates more diverse geomorphic units, which ultimately is more complex habitat and results in a uh, more biodiverse and resilient riverscape. And so um, I think it's important to recognize that it's this diversity that can help deal with fine sediments. Um, you know, here's, here's a, a stream that's very homogeneous. Um, there's very little structure in the way of, of beaver dams and wood. And what you're left with, you know, is mostly just large material that's embedded with fine sediments. Um, but when you put structure in, uh, you're creating this hydraulic diversity. So here we got that high gradient where it's all cobble in the back here. Um, as the water starts to slow down, um, well, most of the, you know, a lot of the finer materials are mobilized in this when the water is fast like this. And then as the water slows down, uh, different sediment um, classes start to deposit depending on water velocity. And so here is a bunch of gravel. And then as we get, this is actually a beaver dam in the foreground. As we get close to the beaver dam, you get the fine sediment. So we have gravels that are good for spawning. We have deep pools um, that are good for uh, fish for, for resting. We got these uh, more um, cascade type features that are good for production of um, invertebrates and food and such. And so that's, I, I think fine sediments are a problem when you don't have structure. When you have structure, it can deal with fine sediments. And I, I think it's an overrated uh, issue. And so, you know, what we want to, what we suggest is to use adaptive management to try to address multiple concerns, um, you know, put, put out your hypothesis of how this is gonna work, but also take into consideration other people's concerns such as sediments, monitor to see if some of these negative impacts are happening, but also to learn about the positive impacts. Um, and we have a, a paper that we wrote, it's, it's about doing adaptive management for um, process-based restoration that has a lot of this information about how do we know when to do maintenance or um, how do we know when to do the next phase? Uh, 
I don't have time to go into that right now, but an adaptive management framework is a way to deal with these concerns and to help us identify the time frames that we need to deal with. Um, and so I think the challenge now is to try to get the uh, funding and permitting um, processes kind of along the same time frame as uh, the way this process-based restoration is expected to occur. Well, Nick, I think that was entirely on topic. I'm going to warn everyone, we seem to have a, a chatty crew, so we're going to run right up until um, the time you've allocated for our being together. So I really encourage you to put questions in the chat um, so that we can get back to you with any questions or concern that you might have. And, and Nick, if you would um, stop sharing, that will allow our next speakers who are uh, Damien Ciotti and uh, Shelly Wingo from US Fish and Wildlife uh, Service to share their experience with process-based restoration. Thank you. Thanks, Betsy and Shelly. Um, yep, yeah, I'm Damien Ciotti with US Fish and Wildlife Service uh, Coastal Program with uh, Shelly from Partners Program. And uh, we provide technical assistance and funding for habitat restoration. I, I think we started, uh, applying process-based restoration approaches probably back in around 2014 after, um, after seeing the examples uh, from Betsy and, and other folks up in the Scott River. And uh, I'm just gonna give a, a uh, presentation overview here. And I think, uh, I, I really, I think this, this um, effort of scaling up and ecological restoration is so critical uh, uh, for our program, something we think about a lot uh, within the different eco regions where we work, um, you know, to really have a, a, a significant influence on the sensitive species we're trying to restore. And so a lot of what I wanna talk about is, is uh, geared towards um, uh, just how we, uh, how our thinking in process-based restoration is uh, you know, evolved over the years, and um, and then some of the lessons learned, and and some of the metrics uh, that we've we're looking at uh, for monitoring uh, uh, these approaches as well, um, which I think are all important for uh, scaling up uh, this approach. Uh, so this is from a um, paper that. Uh, uh, few of us collaborated on from, from different uh, federal agencies on really trying to um, uh, identify metrics for design and for monitoring of process-based approaches and in how and in, in really defining the, the difference between this approach and, and form-based and not from a standpoint of, of you know, a critical of, of one uh, or the other, uh, we still use form-based approaches in, in the uh, in our program, um, but it's important to identify early in the design process uh, where uh, these approaches apply and, or how to integrate them properly. And when we look at a, a form-based approach or process-based approach, they're going to kind of start out similar um, where they're perhaps addressing some source problems of infrastructure or land management. Um, but the form-based approach is going to heavily rely on, uh, you know, external materials and, and power from fossil fuel to implement and, and construct the form, whereas obviously with a process-based approach, we're really relying on solar, on uh, flood impulse and, and biological energy within that system. And, and then the... Uh, you know, just the space involved in connectivity. Um, with a form-based approach, you can you can use this approach within an, within more urban areas, within areas where you're more restricted for space. Uh, whereas with process-based approach, we're really trying to reconnect the system uh, as fully as we can uh, within that approach. And then just some general. Um, uh, objectives within a uh, form-based approach um, are, you know, this, this idea of sediment and water continuity through, through the project site so that you maintain uh, a specific form versus with a process-based approach, we're really focused on storage of water, storage of sediment and nutrients in that system and increasing productivity and, and really restoring dynamic uh, 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 
channel evolution also to that system. And these are important concepts. Uh, we're important for us to, to differentiate early on in order to figure out how to apply it and where it applies. Um, and just some simple uh, measures of, uh, you know, process. What are we talking about? I mean, there's so many different processes, um, but when we're talking about scaling up, uh, looking at riparian productivity, how's it changing at the valley scale? These are easy things for us to monitor uh, with, with publicly available data. Um, you know, channel migration, channel change. Uh, we can easily follow these metrics with, with our projects or at, you know, at larger valley scales um, within these systems. And, uh, and then of course, uh, these are gonna be related to um, uh, increases in water nutrients and sediment storage within these systems. So uh, some lessons learned, um, it, it's certainly best uh, when we're combining these um, you know, BDAs, uh, low tech PBR approaches with other uh, with addressing other source problems in the system. Our best projects we have are those in which we've, we've been able to address or you know, not fully address all the source problems, but at least identify them and, uh, and begin to work on those, uh, which typically are infrastructure or land management issues. And so just an example of that, um, this is a site in the Sierra Foothills uh, where in year one, you see where um, we've constructed a small BDA within the incised channel. And as Nick mentioned, you know, having that ability to get in there and do some small monitoring structures initially is so critical to just getting the ball rolling on this. Um, so we built that structure and then we follow, we, we also remove uh, some levee material that was along this floodplain. In year one, that, that structure uh, uh, routes, you know, the channel migrates around it, and that's good. We want channel migration, you know, and even though we are delivering sediment down to another depositional zone, um, we don't want to harden these areas off. That's what we're getting away from is, is this idea of hardening the system. Uh, so then year two, we follow that uh, meander out and extend that beaver dam analog further, and we get we start to really get connectivity. This is how we really start to get fine uh, uh, deposition of fine materials, not just sand and gravel, but silt, clay, those, those fine sediments uh, that we want to hold within the system, we need to reconnect, uh, reconnect it to these floodplains. And then by year three, we see uh, a new channel forming. You know, we're not we still have our old incised channel here, actually, but we have a new smaller channel going out onto the floodplain. Um, so we we just uh, instead of uh, totally changing this um, existing habitat, we're just just extending it out into the floodplain. And we're we're just so appreciative that everyone has had interest in this topic. And and Brad, if we miss the mark on anything and follow up would be useful, just please ask us to do so. And um, I'm sure that any of us would welcome individual questions from any of the attendees. So I'm going to hang a minute and see if any questions pop up in the chat. And perhaps while waiting, I just want to reiterate my gratitude to all of you for doing this. This so far exceeded anything that I had hoped for. It was wonderful. And uh, I don't know that we'd be following up with you because you missed the mark. I think it may be because you hit the mark. We will likely follow up with you. So thanks again. All right. Well, thank everyone again and, and um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon.